Okay, today I want to talk to you about uh, the Ten Commandments. Are they still in effect for a Christian? Uh, what should the Christian do about the Ten Commandments today? What does the Bible say? That's the main thing. And if you're new to these videos uh, and you're looking for a multi-million dollar studio, uh, you're not going to find it here. It's the wrong channel. If you're looking for a multi-million dollar building that I call a church, uh, you've, you're also at the wrong channel. Um, we are Bible believers. Bible believers in the first century met in homes, they met in the streets, they met in the woods, they met wherever. And uh, I'm not meeting in a multi-million dollar building right now. Okay. But uh, let's go first to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Are there commandments given to a Christian? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 2. Okay, it says here, For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Yes, there are commandments for a Christian today. Alright, now how does that relate to the Ten Commandments that were given back in Exodus chapter 20? We're going to look about that in this study. But I'm going to show you that this thing of people thinking, you know, oh, we have liberty, we're under grace and everything, so we're not really under the commandments. Well, there's some truth to that, but to say that we're not really under the commandments, um, I'm going to show you there's actually a lot more than just Ten Commandments for a Christian in the New Testament. But let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 back to when the original Ten Commandments were given to Moses. Exodus chapter 20. I have my notes over here, so that's why I keep looking over this way. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Okay, it says here, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now here's commandment number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. All right? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. That's commandment number two. Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands, thousands of them that love me, and keep my commandments. The Catholic Church removes that commandment right there. Commandment number two. And they split the tenth commandment into two different commandments. Why? Because they do make graven images. And they do bow themselves down to them. To statues of Mary. To statues of the saints. So they got to get rid of commandment number two. That's why if you have a Catholic Bible or if you are a Catholic, that commandment's gone. Interesting. Verse 7, here's commandment number 3. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Don't use God's name unless you're talking to him or about him. Commandment number 4, verse number 8 here. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all them, all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay? Now here we have the rest of the commandments in the next couple of verses. Uh, verse 12. Honor thy father and thy mother, and that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Okay, so there you have the Ten Commandments. And you say, well, those were given to the Jews in the Old Testament, the children of, of Israel, so therefore we don't have to keep any of that today. Well, let's see about that. Is there anything in the New Testament that would point to those laws? Romans chapter 2. I'm going to show you something interesting here. 
Romans chapter 2, verse uh, 12, Romans 2, 12 through 15. Okay, it says here, For as many as, as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Now the thing that's interesting about that is there, it says that the Gentiles, even those that don't have the law, they still have the law written in their heart. Their conscience bearing them witness. Okay, everybody out there, every man, woman, and child that's ever been, has God's laws written in their heart. You know, there's a, there's a king way back there in the Old Testament that takes Sarah, Abraham's wife, and he's actually going to, you know, commit fornication with her, adultery. And God says, if you touch her, you're a dead man. Why? Because she's another man's wife. And the guy says, whoa, whoa, I didn't know that. You know, please, you know, I won't touch her and everything. Now, the interesting thing about that is that was before the law was given. That was before there was a Ten Commandments. What was going on there? God's laws were written in the man's heart. A lost heathen. And he still had those laws written in his heart. Even the most lost, corrupt person out there, unless they've seared their conscience with a hot iron, even the lo most lost person knows, hey, that's another man's wife, don't mess with her. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Nobody out there comes home and, they're, and they've been robbed and they go, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. Everybody out there does not like to be have their things stolen from them. Everybody out there, the most wicked, depraved person, will lock the doors of their car or their house. Nobody out there is just like, oh, I don't care. Whatever. Take whatever you want. Everybody has that knowledge in them. Nobody likes to be lied to. Okay? I mean, you go down through the Ten Commandments, it's there. It's written in people's hearts. So you say, are the Ten Commandments still there? Uh, the Ten Commandments were there before they were even given. <laughs> Something to think about. But now go to Romans chapter 13. Do the actual Ten Commandments come in for a Christian today. Romans chapter 13, verses 9 through 10. It says here, For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Kind of interesting because if you go down through the Ten Commandments, it's all based on love. All of it. Hey, if you love somebody, you know, I love my wife. I'm not going to commit adultery on her or against her. You know, I'm not going to go cheat with another woman. No way. Why? I love my wife. I love, you know, uh, the fact of being safe from a thief. So why would I go out and be a thief myself? You know? I'm not going to steal from somebody else. You know, I have enough love for my fellow man to say, hey, he worked hard for that. Hey, she worked hard for that. I'm not going to go steal from him. I have enough love for people out there to not lie to them. You know, even when they want to hear me lie to them, tell them that things are going to get better and, and that the King James Bible is just a translation and that there's many paths to God and stuff like that. No. If you truly love as a Christian, if you truly love other people, the lost world, You'll tell them the truth. You don't love them if you're lying to them. Even, even if they want to hear the lies. That's not love. But you look at all those different things there. Thou shalt not kill. Obviously, if you're killing people, that's not based on love. It's not motivated about love. You know? So those things are there today for a Christian. But now we, can we find the Ten Commandments? all ten of the commandments in the New Testament as commandments for us today. Well, first of all, we need to look at it as 
What is the purpose of the actual Ten Commandments as given in Exodus chapter 20? What was the purpose of that? Go to Galatians chapter 3. You know, is there a system, that system of the Old Testament law, can you use it for anything today as a Christian? Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. Alright, look at this. It says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, all under sin there, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Oh, uh, wait a second. Just hold on there for a minute. Now, this obviously has to be a mistranslation because, see, people were always saved by faith. Right? That's what a non-dispensationalist will tell you. You just read there, but before faith came. Huh. We were kept under the law. Who's Paul writing about? The Jews. Before faith came. Jesus didn't die on the cross for the people back there in the Old Testament. All right? They had a system of works. Okay? Now, there's always an element of faith involved. All right? But it wasn't faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That came later. That's why they went to a different place when they died. They didn't go directly to heaven. They went down to Abraham's bosom. To be down there waiting for the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's right there. Verse 24. Wherefore, remember from last week's sermon, wherefore, it explains something that says, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Okay? So you see it there. What's the purpose of the Ten Commandments for today? Schoolmaster. To bring somebody to Jesus Christ. Well, what does a schoolmaster do for the children? A schoolmaster comes in and he says, Okay kids, okay class, let's learn about America, we'll say. Because that's where we're at here in this country. Um... When was America founded? What makes us Americans? The schoolmaster teaches children the basics. The law, as a schoolmaster, teaches the sinner that they are a sinner. Alright? Some guy says, well, I'm not a bad person. I mean, you ask the average lost person, if you died tonight, do you know for sure where you would go? They, most of them will say, I think I'd go to heaven. Oh, I think I'd go to heaven. You know, why is that? You want to come out of their mouth the next time? Because I'm not a bad person. Most people are self-righteous. They're trusting in their own righteousness. That's what's going to send them to hell. Okay? And until they repent of trusting in their own self-righteousness, until they understand I'm a sinner and I need to come to God as a filthy, rotten sinner, until they get to that point, they're never going to be saved. Okay? And lead them in some kind of prayer, that's false conversion. Okay, that's why you have these people that have never been convicted of being sinners and they're out there and they're living just like the lost world but with a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. And those people are the greatest threat to you as a Bible believer. Hands down, there's nobody that's a greater threat to you than that. Be why? They'll turn you over in a second. Oh yeah, they will. But what you got to do with these people is you take them to that schoolmaster. You say, okay, you're not a sinner. Let me ask you a question. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. Did you ever tell a lie? You know? Well, yeah, everybody tells a lie from time to time. Okay, what's that make you? A liar. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Did you ever take something that wasn't yours? Most of them will go, no, I never have. Really? You never cheated on a test? Looked over at somebody, you know, in public school and copied down their answers? That's stealing. 
You never went to somebody else's property and stole things from them? You never went in the store as a little kid and stole something that you didn't pay for? Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Come on. Give me a break. Okay, you've stolen. What's that make you? A thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? That makes you a blasphemer. Have you ever looked on a woman with lust? Well, the Bible says, if you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. So you are a blaspheming, adultering, lying thief. Now, if God judges you by that standard, where do you think you're going to go? Heaven or hell? All of a sudden, they start to realize, hey, maybe I'm not such a good person after all. Maybe the only good person is God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he died on the cross to pay for a rotten sinner like me. You see? See how it works? And you say, okay, I think I'd like to get saved. Um, what are those Ten Commandments again? All right, from this day forward, <clears throat> I will never tell another lie. I shall never commit adultery. I shall never um, steal. I shall never kill. I will always honor my father and mother. I will never blaspheme the name of God. I will. You aren't going to be able to keep that. See, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But when you get to Christ, then that's the end of the law. The law has done its, its purpose in your life. And now, in terms of salvation, as far as your eternity, heaven or hell, now the law is done. Its work as a schoolmaster is finished. But, here's the interesting thing. If you live as a Christian, and you're doing right before the Lord, you will actually still keep the Ten Commandments. Not to stay saved, not to be saved, but because you are saved. He say, prove it. Okay, that's what this study's about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. This is for those people out there that think that they have to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved or to stay saved. Galatians chapter 5 verse 4 says, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. That's one of the things that this Messianic Jew movement is all about. And half the time they're not even Jews. You know, most of the time they have not one drop of Jewish blood in them. They can't trace their ancestry back to Shem. They're either of Japheth or Ham most of the time, which is really quite ridiculous. Okay, you better be careful about calling yourself a Jew when you're not one. But you see what they'll do is they'll try to get you back under the law. First they'll start to get you off and try to say Yeshua and, and all this other stuff like that. Start using Hebrew names for words that are in English in your King James Bible. Words that are in English that came from Greek. You know, and they'll say, Jesus is a, is a name of a pagan deity. You know, oh, yeah, okay, whatever. It's only worked for thousands of years, you know, and changed the world in the name of Jesus, you know, like they know what they're talking about. Give me a break. But the whole point is, you follow that movement to its logical conclusion, they try to get you back under the law. And guess what? If you go back under the law to try and justify yourself, you're being self-righteous. And you're fallen from grace, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. It's not of the Lord. That movement is not of the Lord. Romans chapter 3. We'll go there next. What is the purpose of the law? Romans chapter 3, verses 28 through 31. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. You come to salvation, you come to Jesus Christ because you are shown to be a sinner by the law. The law is your schoolmaster. But you're justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Verse 29, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Notice the circumcision there is the Jews, the uncircumcision is the Gentiles. Okay? They're both justified by faith. Verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. You see, when you're trying to live under the law, and you're trying to live by 
uh, standards that, that keep you from sin and things like that, you can't do it. And so what you're doing your whole life, you're just like, oh man, I, I, I messed up. I got to get saved again. And, you know, that's what these people that doubt their salvation, they're always getting re-saved, you know, retreads. And they're, they're always, oh, I'm get, i got to get saved, i got to get saved. Oh no, I, I messed up again. And they just live a life, a miserable life of trying to keep themselves saved. You can't do it. But what happens is when you get saved, it's kind of ironic because when you actually get saved and the Holy Ghost comes in, lives within you, your body becomes a whole, the temple of the Holy Ghost, you will actually start to live by the Bible and you'll actually start to keep the Ten Commandments, which is interesting. In other words, when you try to make the effort yourself to stay saved, you fail. But when you get saved and you're trying to live for the Lord, you'll actually succeed by keeping the commandments. Let me show you. Commandment number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter four verses one through five. Can you keep the first commandment if you are a Christian? Absolutely. Second Corinthians chapter four verse one. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now look at verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Now, do you worship the God of this world? I hope not. If you're a Christian, you better not be worshiping the God of this world. The God of this world is Satan right now. Notice it's a lowercase g there. It's kind of funny because all these atheists, whenever you get an atheist posting a comment, nine times out of ten they'll write, I don't worship your God, and they'll make it a lowercase g. And it's kind of funny because it's like, well, uh, my God is capital G. Your God is a lowercase g, you know. They don't realize it. They think, you know, that they don't worship anybody. It's like, well, I hate to tell you there, honey, but you do worship Satan. So, you know, I know you might not do the black pentagrams and paint your fingernails black and all the other stuff and human sacrifice and whatever else. I mean, you don't follow Anton LaVey or whatever, but you are worshiping Satan. You either worship God or you worship the devil. That's it. What other choice do you have? None. One or the other. So, the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? Can you keep that as a Christian? Absolutely. Sure. It comes naturally. By you saying, No one else but Jesus Christ. There is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. You know? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I have no problem worshiping only God. I can keep the first commandment with no problem. All right, Matthew chapter 6, 24. Here's another good one. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Do you have another God before you? You say, well, I don't worship the devil. Okay, do you worship mammon? Are you more interested in serving mammon than you are serving the Lord? I'll tell you right now, true service to the Lord does not lend to much riches. You might have to lay down some earthly treasures to lay up treasures in heaven. Not may, you will. So there are many Christians that unfortunately, even though they don't worship Satan the God of this world, they do worship the God Mammon. Hmm. So you better be sure that your God is the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven and not the devil and not Mammon. Better make sure about that. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. What about this in the New Testament? Is this still there? Turn to Acts chapter 17.
Acts chapter 17. Okay, verses 29 through 31. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. No, not to worship any graven images? Graven there? And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Not believe and receive. Repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he raised him from the dead. And that he hath raised him from the dead. Excuse me. Do you have images of the Godhead? You say like what? Well, if you have a New King James Bible, there's a good chance somewhere in that thing, maybe inside the front cover, I know they don't do it as much anymore, but the old one, they had the big trichatra right on the front, the three-pointed star, you know? And people go, well, it just means the Godhead, it's the Trinity. You're not supposed to make any image of the Godhead, okay? That's disobeying there the second commandment. And uh, now I'm going to make it even more personal. Do you have any pictures of this guy that they claim is Jesus Christ? You know, I see these paintings all the time, you know, this long-haired guy in these beautiful robes and he's knocking on the door, you know. Or he's there holding a sheep or something, has it around his neck, you know, and all this stuff. You say, well, that's Jesus. Really? You think Jesus posed? You think he's out there, you know, preaching to the people and he goes, oh, oh, excuse me. Hold on a second. I, my artist is here. I got I to gotta pose for the painting. Oh, here's a lamb. You know, are you done yet? <laughs> uh, that's not Jesus. And my contention is that this guy that they've been painting for a long time, I think when the Antichrist shows up, he's going to look like that guy. Deceive the whole world. It's going to be something. I don't think that you should have paintings of this Jesus guy around your home. The Bible doesn't give you a description of what Jesus actually looked like. In fact, the Bible, I should say, let me say this, in Isaiah 53, it says that when we shall see him, there's no beauty in him, that we should desire him. He wasn't handsome. I'm real sorry. You look at the guy in the paintings, he's this real good looking guy, long flowing, beautiful hair. You know, I'd be real careful about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll go there next. You know, another painting that you see is this picture of this Jesus dude, and he's like hugging, you know, somebody, you know, he has in, like his head on their neck and stuff, you know, and hugging him, welcome home, you know, and all this stuff. Read the Bible. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, when he sees Jesus Christ in Revelation, He's fallen down on his face. You know what I think is going to happen at the rapture? When we see Jesus, we're not going to go up and, Hey, Jesus! You know, I think we're going to be hitting the clouds. <laughs> we're going to hit the dirt. I mean, we're going, to be, we're going to be down. I think it's going to be a fearful thing. A reverential fear. You know, the fear of seeing the King of the universe. King of kings and Lord of lords. Boom, down you go. But continuing, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 7. Now this is for a New Testament Christian. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Speaking about the people in the Old Testament, and here you have a New Testament command saying that you're not to be an idolater. Hmm. Interesting. Verse 14, look at this one. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. Well, brother, I'm saved. It don't, you know, I, I'm washed in the blood. I can do whatever I want, stay in fellowship with the Lord and whatever. No, you can't. No, you can't. And if you're living right before the Lord Jesus Christ, you will flee from idolatry. You will not want to have anything between you and your Lord. You won't have any idols. Look down at verse 19. What say I then? 
that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, the Lord doesn't like idols. Never did. You know, probably one of the most hated sins in the entire Bible is the sin of idolatry. He doesn't like it. And you see that thing over and over and over again in the Old Testament. It's a real bad thing to have idols. Now, if you are, you know, there's a lot of different people out there that claim to be Christians. And, you know, you have this whole thing of the Eucharist celebration. And, you know, I know that it's actually done a lot in quote-unquote Protestant churches, you know, like the Lutherans and things, some of these people. And it's like, well, you know, we believe and teach that the bread becomes the body and the wine becomes the blood and all that stuff, you know. And it's not in remembrance. It's actually, you know, close to being the literal sacrifice there. And, you know, this is kind of helps to merit salvation. You know what that is? It's an idol. You know, when the Catholics put their their host, the Eucharistic host, into the monstrance and the priest carries it around, the people are bowing down to it. I've seen it. I saw it in real life. I was down in Costa Rica. I saw the people, the processional going down the street, the people bowing to it. You know, you know what that is? It's idolatry. God hates it. You know, you drive down the road and you go past somebody's house and you look out there and you see that little Mary statue, you know, standing there like this praying or whatever. You know what that is? It's an idol. And there in verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, I'm sorry, verse 20, it says that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils. You know what an idol is? It's a devil. And you study who the Mary is of the Roman Catholic Church, she's a devil. She's Semiramis. Or Xingmu, if you're Chinese, or Diana, or Artemis, or all these names. They just recently, you know, the, the pagan Romans came along and they said, let's steal the names from the Bible and teach people that. Because Christianity is getting too big, so we need to usurp the authority of this thing. So they took their pagan deity, Diana, and they said, let's make her into Mary. And it's interesting because look it up sometime. Look at some old paintings of old Catholic, Roman Catholic paintings of Mary. She has blonde hair. The old ones. Pure, silky blonde hair. And then you study the thing of the Lord of the Rings with John Ronald Rule Tolkien, who was a fanatical Catholic, and he made his elf witch, Lady Galadriel, he made her with pure golden hair. And he had a Jesuit priest write to him and said, this Lady Gal Galadriel, is she a type of Mary? Is she your, your story's Mary? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. See, Tolkien actually knew what Catholicism was. He knew it was the ancient mystery Babylonian system. That's what his whole story, the Lord of the Rings, the whole story is about that mystery Babylon, Babylon system. Mixed in with Nordic paganism and witchcraft and everything else. He mixed a whole bunch of occultism together and repackaged it and brought it out to kind of indoctrinate the masses into the idea of the occult. And all of a sudden people are going, oh, you know, Gandalf the wizard is a type of Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that you're not to seek after wizards, to be defiled by them. Think of the underlying little thing there, the underlying little theme. You know, you seek after a wizard, you're defiled by it. And Tolkien has a wizard picturing Jesus Christ. I could do a whole thing on that, but the point is, the Roman Catholic Church has idols, and those idols are devils. It's not, oh, Saint so-and-so, it takes away your toothaches. It's a devil. And they learned a long time ago that instead of having these pagan deities and stuff and these weird creatures and everything, you know, no, you just have a saint. And you have a little guy standing there, you know, like that or something. You know, whatever. And you, oh, it's Saint so-and-so, Saint so-and-so. Idols, idols. That's why they take out the second commandment. You as a Christian better not have those idols in your life. You better get them out. And if you're truly Bible-believing Christian, you don't need idols. You don't need them. 
You can worship God alone, no other God, and you don't need graven images. I don't need to see pictures of what Jesus might have looked like. I don't need to see it. I have a Bible, and I have faith in the Bible. Commandment number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 1. First Timothy 6, verse 1. I'm going to show you an interesting thing here. It says, Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, this is talking about bond servants, but in a sense, if you're working for a secular boss, a guy that's lost, you want to make sure that you live a good Christian testimony around that guy so that he doesn't blaspheme God as a result of your life. Now, obviously, it just kind of goes along common sense that you don't take the name of the Lord in vain if you're saved. You shouldn't be going around saying, using God's name for a curse word. Obviously. Okay? But it even goes beyond that into saying, you're not that cause other people to blaspheme God because of your bad actions. Very important. Let me show you another one. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 verses 3 through 5. Turn over there real quick. Okay, it says here, The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You say, well, that's the word of God, not the name of God. We better pay attention to Psalm 138, verse 2. Okay, It says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. If you are causing God's word to be blasphemed, then you are causing the lost world to basically take God's name, God's word in vain. So not only are you not supposed to, to use God's name as a curse word, but you're not by your actions to cause other people to do the same lost world. So you better be careful about that. You say, is there a way I can keep the third commandment? Yeah. Sure. Be a good worker. Be a good wife. And if you don't, you're not keeping the third commandment. But you see, again, it's not this, this extreme effort that you have to, you know, i got to keep the commandments. i got to keep the commandments. You live as a Christian, you'll keep them. It just comes automatically. But let's continue here. What about commandment number four? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Go back to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. Now this one here, I'm going to show you some things about this. Exodus 31, verse 15 through 17. Okay, it says here, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the, in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Obviously, that is not for today. Okay, you don't put people to death because they worked on the Sabbath day. It's kind of funny, too, because the Seventh day Adventists, you know, they try to get people off on this issue, and yet you don't often see them putting people to death in their system that work on the Sabbath day. But you see, the death penalty is connected with it. So if you're going to keep the Sabbath day, then you should also be putting people to death. Well, they, they must have missed that part of the verse. Yeah. Verse 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Who? The children of Israel. Verse 17, It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Notice that the Sabbath day is a sign between God and the children of Israel. 
Okay? So this is one of the commandments that that actual commandment with the death penalty attached to it, no, we don't have to keep that. Why? Because right now the Lord has put off the Sabbath day. You say, well then, He put off the system of the law permanently, it's all done. Right? Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Uh, did this event happen yet? No. This is the coming time of Jacob's trouble. The coming time of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. So, God brings back that system, that law. Faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. They have to go back to keeping the commandments. All ten of them. You as a Christian really only have to keep nine. You do not have to keep the Sabbath day today. And some nut comes along and they say, Well, the Sabbath day is today, and if you, if you worship on a Sunday, you're worshiping the mark of the beast, and or you've taken the mark of the beast, and all this other nutty Seventh-day Adventist nonsense. Ask them if any member of their cult, if any member of their system, has ever disobeyed the Sabbath day, and if so, did they put them to death? They aren't going to do it. No way. And it's funny because, you know, they'll say about, well, we meet together and stuff on the Sabbath day. Oh, you meet together? You mean you go out and you drive? You get gas for your vehicle? Sounds like work. God dropped a guy for picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. But you can drive your vehicle? Come on. Come on. You know, what a bunch of nonsense. Don't fall for the Seventh-day Adventist lie. Okay? Acts chapter 20, verse 7. You say, well, uh, but the Christians are supposed to meet on the Sabbath day, right? Acts 20, verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, not the seventh day, the seventh day is Saturday, okay? Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Wait a second. The early Christians were meeting on the first day of the week? Yeah. Uh-huh. They were. You know why? Because the Christian church was designed to survive persecution. That's why we don't have actual buildings where you are required to go and meet. We don't have synagogues. We don't have temples. Why? We need to remain flexible. And I'll tell you right now, you look at the majority of church history, there's never been a time for thousands of years, you know, since the very beginning we had buildings that we called churches. No, we didn't. And you study it, study it out, every single building that's called a church, it all ties back to the Catholic Church. Every single one of them. All the Protestant churches, all of them, tie back that they took the practice from Roman Catholicism of having a building there with the ordained clergy up on the pulpit and the laity down in the service there. Every single one of them. You say, well, brother, not the Independent Baptists. The Independent Baptists are not part of the Protestant Reformation. Really? What about uh, John Smythe? He was an uh, Anglican before he became an Anabaptist. What about um, Roger Williams? Roger Williams, brother, he was solid. He was fundamental. And he was also Anglican. Study it. Study it. You will see that every single building ties back to Catholicism. Every single one of them. So I don't like that. Well, sorry about that. But it's the truth. Okay? They met on the first day of the week. And if we come under persecution before the rapture, and that's entirely possible, you are not going to be able to meet every week from sun, Sunday morning from 9 to 12. You can't do it. You're going to have to be flexible. Guess what? I really hate to tell you this. I'm going to shock you. Some of you are really bad with this. 
as I'm recording this, it's not Sunday morning. <gasps> no. Yeah. We meet different days. But we worship the Lord all the time. See, that's the other thing about these buildings, these church buildings. You know, when do you worship the Lord? Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday. What about the other days? Well, those are my days off. I don't have to go to church then. Uh, aren't you in church in those other days? Well, no, I watch TV in those days. But don't worry, I do plenty of things during the week that I would never do when I'm in church. Oh boy. Continuing on here. What about commandment number five? Honor thy father and mother. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. And by the way, I'll say this too about the thing of remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, for six days the Lord made heaven and earth and rested on the seventh. Brethren, I do believe that you need to have one day a week that you rest. Which there again. Time to kick it again. This whole system of the church building structure. You're not resting the seventh day. You get up early, you got to get to the building. And then when you get there, you got to go do bus ministry. And you're running, driving all over the place, picking up the kids up and going and, oh, i got to teach Sunday school this week. That's right, i got to go in there teaching Sunday school. Oh, i got to go up to the choir. i got to sing in choir. And then, and then you get done with the service. So i got to run the kids back. And then you come back and you got to go home. you got to get lunch. Go back, eat eat your meal or whatever. Take a little bit of a nap. Come back. you got to have choir practice. And then you have your evening service. And then you have fellowship after that. Is that a day of rest? You have to put on the pageant every week. And you have, to, you have to go and you have your special costume and you have to play your part and everything. Okay, you know, time for choir. Oh, time to teach. Oh, da, 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 da. You're not resting. That's not restful. <laughs> Honor thy father and mother. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay? Honor your father and mother. Now, is that difficult to do if you're a Christian? Shouldn't be. You say, my parents are lost. What do I do? Honor them. You say, what, by going over and not judging them or not being harsh with them or anything like that? That's not honor. Honor is going and respecting their home, respecting the rules of their home, but witnessing to them. Speaking the truth in love. See, that's honoring them. And doing nice things for them even if they can't stand you and can't stand your beliefs and things like that. Showing them that you still respect them. Thanking them for the way that they raised you. Putting clothes on your back, food in your stomach. Honor thy father and mother. Not that difficult. If you're a Christian, that should come automatically. How about commandment number six? Thou shalt not kill. First Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four, verses 14 and 15. Okay, it says here, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the Spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. You're not to suffer as a murderer. You know, you don't kill somebody and then say, I got put in jail. I'm being persecuted as a Christian. No, you're not. You're being persecuted because you're a murderer. And you should be executed for that. Which Paul talked about. You know, he said, If I have done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. The death penalty is there for a Christian. But the point is, you're not to suffer as a murderer. And again, this is fairly obvious. This shouldn't take much of an effort on your part as a Christian. To not want to murder people. I know sometimes you're tempted to. But 
You're not supposed to. So it's not that you have to go out of your way and be like, I must keep the Ten Commandments to stay saved. No, it should come automatically as a Christian. Those Ten Commandments are really not that difficult. Okay? If you have to keep them perfectly to be saved, oh yeah, you can't do that. You fall from grace when you do that. But if you get saved, that should just be part of your life. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. Okay, it says here, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. It's supposed to be. Verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now Jesus Christ talked about if any man hate not his brother, mother, father, sister, you know, whatever in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You know, it's not talking about hate in the sense of, you know, hating a family member. Okay, this is speaking about a saved brother or sister. And it doesn't mean when it says, you know, when Jesus said that you're to hate father, mother, but whatever. He's just simply saying, if you're putting your love for them above me, then you can't be my disciple. If you're not willing to follow me because it will offend family, then you're not my disciple. That's what Jesus was saying. He doesn't mean that you have to go up and smack your brother or sister in the face and say, I hate your guts. No, it's not what it's talking about there. But what's going on here in 1 John chapter 3 is it's he's saying you're not supposed to hate your brother in Christ. You say, well, I can't stand a certain guy. I know he's saved, but I can't stand him. What do you do? Well, all through the New Testament, it's given avoid him. Stay away from him. You know, from such withdrawal thyself, over and over and over again, get away from them. Doesn't mean you have to hate them. Doesn't mean you say, I hate that guy, I can't stand that guy. No. Because if you hate them, the Bible says you're a murderer. Likens you to a murderer. So, you know, it doesn't mean you just go around like this little new ager going, I love everybody. I love everything. I don't ever get mad at anybody. No. What you do is you say, that guy over there is really messed up. I'm just going to avoid him. I'm just going to stay away from him. See you later. Goodbye. You know, because if you're hating people that are saved, your brother or sister in the Lord, that's a problem. Again, thou shalt not kill. If you hate people, if you hate a brother or a sister, you're likened to a murderer. Don't do that. How about thou shalt not commit adultery? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter six, verses fifteen through twenty. Okay, it says here, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, any woman that would mess with a married Christian man, I can guarantee you she's a harlot. She might not charge you for that, you know, experience, but uh, if she's willing to join her body with you, she's a harlot. You know, she just does it for free. Okay? Now, Christian man out there, or a Christian woman, why would you commit adultery if you have a saved husband or wife? Even if you're married to somebody that's lost, why would you cheat on them? You know, that's a problem. Again, if you are living right before God, you don't have to go out of your way to say, oh, that's right, I have to keep thou shalt not commit adultery to be saved. You don't need to do that. It should come naturally. 
Okay, as a saved Christian, you should say, I don't want to join my body with anybody else. If I join my body with the harlot, then I'm making the members of Christ a harlot. Again, you, you don't have to go out of your way to keep this stuff. It should come naturally as a Christian. If you're a new creature, now, if you've prayed some prayer without any change in your life, well, <laughs> there's no telling what you'll do after you get saved. But that's been covered before. How about commandment number eight? Thou shalt not steal. Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four, verse 28. Okay, it says here, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now you talk about a changed life right there. How about that one? You know what the reason is for a man to steal? Most of the time I realize if it's desperation and whatever else, you know, there's a total hurricane comes through or something like that and you, you have no choice. All, everything's all chaos and it's like if I don't, you know, there's a store, you know, and the windows are busted out and whatever, and I got to go in there and get a piece of loaf of bread or something. But then you should go back later and you should try to pay the guy for the loaf of bread that you had to take to feed your family, you know, kind of thing. But the main reason people steal is because they're too lazy to work. And here it says that you're to rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good. Get a job. Work with your hands. Do something to make a living, an honest living. And then, look what it goes on to say, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Isn't that interesting? Here you get some guy as a thief going around robbing people and stealing from people, and he gets saved, and he goes up and he sees some needy person, and he goes, here, this is for you. What does that indicate? It indicates a changed life, a new creature in Christ Jesus. So again, is there this thing of not stealing, thou shalt not steal, is it there for a Christian today? Yes. Yeah. And if you're living right, and if you're doing right before the Lord, it really shouldn't be that difficult for you. What about the commandment number nine, thou shalt not bear false witness? Jump up to verse 25 there in Ephesians chapter 4. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, if you remember earlier there in Romans chapter 13, verse 9, it talked about love, loving your neighbor. That's the greatest commandment. If you love your neighbor, then all these other things will happen. Well, if you speak truth with your neighbor, is that love? Yes. If you speak error and lies and deception with your neighbor, do you really love them? No. No. If your neighbor's lost and you say to him, yeah, you know, you're a good person. I don't think God's going to judge you and send you to hell. You don't love your neighbor. You're lying to him. You are bearing false witness. But if you say, well, you need to understand that if you die without Jesus Christ, you are going to go to hell and you're going to burn. I don't want that for you. I'd like to tell you how to get saved. That's love. Okay? Speaking the truth in love. How about commandment number 10? Thou shalt not covet. And it gave the whole list of different things there. Is that for a Christian today? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 7. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater, oh boy, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. So, thou shalt not covet. Does that apply to us today as Christians? You better believe it. Sure, absolutely. You know the Bible says there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Food and raiment? 
Hey, do you have a roof over your head? That's an extra blessing. Do you have a Bible? That's an extra blessing. Do you have money in your wallet? That's an extra blessing. Do you have a vehicle? Do you have a computer? goes on and on and on. Those are all extra blessings. God says food and raiment. The food in your stomach and the clothes on your back. That you're to be content with that. So if you're to be content with that, then anything over and above that is a blessing. Oh, but, but uh, boy, I wish I had a bigger house and I, I wish I had a, my business was bigger and I wish... I wish I had more money and oh, wouldn't it be neat to have a private jet? And I mean, wouldn't it be cool to have a yacht? Wow, I saw this yacht the one time, I was so impressed by it and oh, what are you doing? You're a saint if you're saved. According to the Bible there, you're not to even mention that. Let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. And you know, I'm going to say something else here, and I might do, have to do something on this in the future. I've been real disturbed lately, as my wife and I are going through this housing situation, I've been real disturbed to find all over the internet, I'm finding these New Agers, lost, hell-bound sinners, and they're living debt-free. And then I look at Christians, and they're drowning in debt most of the time. And they're living in these huge big houses that they can't afford that are mortgaged to the hilt and they're driving around brand new vehicles. I've seen Christians driving fifty, sixty thousand dollar vehicles. And I'm going, why is this? Why is it that Christians are not living debt free, even though the Bible says in Romans chapter 13 that we're to owe no man? And yet the lost world have enough sense to live debt free. Hmm. Very interesting. You think maybe it would have something to do with covetousness? Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, but, but uh, don't worry because, you know, when the rapture happens, you don't need to worry about your things. God's going to send down His holy angels and they're going to gather around your home. And any thieves or, or, you know, people that come to your home, God's going to say, Hey, back off. These things belong to my Christian saint that's with me in heaven right now, and I have to preserve them for seven years so that when they come back, they'll have all their stuff that they've amassed. And I'm kicking myself right now too, brethren. I've got a lot of stuff. Maybe not as much as some people, but I have things that I don't need. And unfortunately, some of that stuff was bought through covetousness. I'm admitting a fault. Okay? I'm not perfect. You know? Watch out for covetousness. Beware of covetousness. When we leave at the rapture, brethren, everything that you own is going to be taken by the Antichrist. Or by people that follow the Antichrist. Everything. When you come back after the time of Jacob's trouble, you're not going to come back to your house. To your belongings. Hmm. Do you think maybe we could learn uh, some lessons from those New Agers about living debt-free? Hmm. Interesting. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 10. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice that none of the others are called idolatry, but covetousness is. Pretty rough, isn't it? Verse 6, For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, uh, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. You are to be different after you get saved. Alright? Watch out for covetousness. If you're living right before the Lord, you'll be content with such things as you have. 
Now, that doesn't mean that you can't ever get food because, you know, I should be content with the fact that I have no food. Well, no, there's a necessity there. If you need a place to live, sure, get a place to live. But consider it doing it in a way that you can pay for what you're going to buy without getting into debt. You say, well, that's difficult. You're telling me it's difficult. But I'll tell you what, it's worth it in the long run. And what kind of Christians do you think we could have if we had Christians that were all debt-free? Wow. Oh, but uh, brother, <laughs> I got a building that's called a church. And that building, I mean, I was going to one the one time, the thing was worth over a million dollars, the property. And they still had $150,000 to pay off yet. And they were renting out part of the property to people to come garden there, you know, because they could write that off in their taxes because, see, the whole property was 501c3, so that was a charitable or uh, ministry or something like that that they were doing. It was absurd. It was absurd. They had a couple acres of yard that had to be mowed. Why? Why? What is it? Covetousness. That's what it was. And of course they kept talking about going back to the old glory days when Jerry Falwell spoke there and, and when uh, Jack Hiles preached there and stuff, you know, and I believe we're going to bring it back, you know, and all this other stuff. Uh -huh. Covetousness, brethren. Stay away from it. Now, you say, okay, well then I, I can see that the Ten Commandments are there definitely for a Christian today. I can see that. Yeah, they're there. They should be part of your life. You shouldn't have to go out of your way to keep the commandments to be saved, okay? If you do that, if you believe that you're justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. So the commandments are not there to be saved, but they should be part of your life as a Christian. It should just come naturally, except for the keeping the Sabbath thing. Rest one day a week, sure, no problem. But to keep the Sabbath day, and if you don't, you die, you know, no, that's not there. That's a sign between God and Israel. So that commandment, right now, is null and void. It will come back, though, after the rapture. Which, again, is another proof for the pre-tribulation rapture. But, um, how about commandments that are not part of the Ten Commandments for a New Testament Christian? If you remember there at the, at the beginning of the study, we read uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter, let's see, where is it here? 4 verse 2. And Paul says that he, we have given you commandments by the Lord Jesus. What are these commandments? Well, let's go to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 25. Now, I want to, we're going to play a little game here, okay? As I'm reading, try to see if you can count commandments, things that are given. Now, these don't, are not the Ten Commandments, but these are commandments that are given in these verses, okay? Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 25. Here we go. Ready? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ uh, forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which... Also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving God, thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Now, I don't know how many you counted, but I counted 20. Okay? Say, so let's go over it again. Verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, there's one, 
Kindness, two. Humbleness, three. Meekness, four. Long-suffering, five. So there's five in that verse. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. There's two. Okay? Verse 14, and above all these things, put on charity. Okay? There's one. All right? So, so far we're up to eight. All right? Verse 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts. There's another one. To the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. There's two. So now we're at 10. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. There's another one. We're up to 11. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's another. So there's two. All right. Uh, verse 17, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, there's another one. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. There's another one. Okay, verse 19, husbands, love your wives. There's one. And be not bitter against them. Two. Okay, children, obey your parents in all things. There's another one. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. Another one. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Another one. And finally, verse 23, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. There's another one. So there's 20. 20 commandments. Just in a couple verses. Okay, I realize here I have verses 24 and 25 written that I was going to read to. I'll just read those quick. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So, those aren't commandments there. Those are just saying, admonishing there. But you see there, just in a couple of verses, there's 20 commandments. Let's play again. Okay? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn over there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to go from verses 14 through 23. Now, let's see if we can count these. And you can do this in every chapter throughout the Pauline epistles. You'd be amazed how many commandments there are. I have no idea. I was thinking about counting them all up. I thought, man, it'd take me forever to get through them all, count up all the commandments. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that might be something for one of you to do out there. Uh, verses 14 through 23. Here we go. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. How many do we have? We have four. Okay? See that none render evil for evil unto any man. There's five. But ever follow that which is good. Six. Both among yourselves and to all men. Alright? Verse 16. Rejoice evermore. Seven. Pray without ceasing. Eight. In everything give thanks. Nine. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Number 10, quench not the spirit. Number 11, despise not prophesyings. Number 12, prove all things. Number 13, hold fast that which is good. Number 14, abstain from all appearance of evil. Verse 22, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in those verses, verses 14 through 23, you have 14 commandments. So, so far in just two chapters, just a few verses, not even the whole chapter, we already have, what, 34, 34 commandments. So you say, are there 10 commandments for Christians? Oh, there's a whole lot more than that. A whole lot more. And notice there, you know, quench not the spirit. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. Quench not. That's a commandment. Not a suggestion. All right, one more time and then we're done. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I got to kick another movement here again, which I love to kick very often because, you know, I like to kick things. 
some of the brethren are so upset at me, and, you know, and I, and I just like to keep them upset, you know, keep the fires going, you know, in them and stuff, you know. It helps them, you know, keeps their blood pressure up, you know, so that, you know, they can feel like they're alive. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Let's see if we can see a few more commandments here. Okay? Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. How many commandments did we see? In those three verses, we saw four commandments. Number one, in verse 14, that they strive not about words to no profit. That's the first one. Number two, in verse 15, study. That's a commandment. That's not a suggestion. It's not saying, if you feel like studying, it might be a good idea. If you want to. You don't have to. No. Study. Study. It's a command. Number three, rightly dividing the word of truth. You say, the whole Bible teaches the same thing. No, it does not. No, it doesn't. Number four, shun profane and vain babblings. Kind of like non-dispensational preaching. You know, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about the millennial kingdom, my wife and I, and, and uh, we were talking about how back there, it's in my one uh, sermon, The Coming Military Dictatorship. You can listen to that. It's here on YouTube. And we were talking about how in the Millennial Kingdom, there's actually a death penalty imposed on people that prophesy. But if you go back there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, verse 20, despise not prophesyings. Wait a second. There's a death penalty for people that prophesy in the Millennial Kingdom, but here it says despise not prophesyings. Wow. Well, I have to make all Scripture reconcile. All Scripture has to mean the same thing. Uh, you're loony. You say, the just shall live by faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Um, how does that work in the Millennial Kingdom when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth? It doesn't work. You cannot be justified by faith alone in the dispensation that is known as the Millennial Kingdom. You must rightly divide the word of truth. Every heresy in this age is a truth in another dispensation. Yeah. Oh, sure. But you see, what these people do is, they say, there are no commandments for a New Testament Christian. We can just live, we're under grace, we're saved by grace, saved by faith, we live by faith, you know, blah, blah, blah. Why well, we don't have to keep the commandments anymore? Well, you don't have to keep the commandments in order to be saved, but you have to keep the commandments to prove that you were saved. You say, then I can never tell a lie? I didn't say that. I didn't say that you'll be perfect after you get saved. A lot of people try to put that on me. They say, oh, he's teaching work salvation. Oh, he's teaching work salvation. Brother, sister, something has to change after you get saved. Something has to change. And if nothing changed, that's like Paul wrote, I'm afraid of you, lest I've bestowed upon you labor in vain. You know? Why would he say that? Can you really waste time on a Christian? Well, I guess so, somewhat. But who were the false brethren that Paul talked about? He's talking about false converts. If there were false converts in the first century, there are false converts today, for sure. <laughs> Big time. You know? And one of the ways that you can tell somebody who's false is they profess that they know God, but in works, they deny Him. Now, you might not know this, but uh, right now, I am standing inside a space shuttle. That's not wood paneling be behind me. That is high-tech Kevlar panels. Say, why? 
Are you crazy? Well, that's similar to saying I'm a Christian, but nothing changed. You see, the way you can tell that I'm not in a space shuttle is by just looking. Common sense. That's wood. And you say, some guy says, I'm a Christian, and you go, you don't look like a Christian, you don't act like a Christian, you don't think like a Christian, you don't talk like a Christian. Chances are they're probably not a Christian. Now, you know, I have some grace for somebody that just got saved and they're still struggling with some sins and whatever, but I've heard people that get saved and it's like they're, you know, Sam Jones, the old Methodist evangelist. We were talking about that, my wife and I, and I said the guy was a drunk, total drunk. He gets saved, boom, drunkenness gone. I've known people that have been smoking and stuff like that. They're real, just chain smokers. They get saved, throw it down. Friend of the family is like that. You know, he got saved, said he couldn't even touch cigarettes after that. He was a mason. Quit the Masonic Lodge. You know, oh, so then he's perfect now. No, he's not perfect. But you can see the works follow that line up with somebody being a true convert. The commandments are there, the Ten Commandments are there to get somebody saved. But after they're saved, those commandments continue in their life. And there's a lot more commandments than just the Ten. But those Ten Commandments, they'll continue in the life of a real true convert. As evidence of their conversion. And if those evidences are gone and they're not there, That's very, very scary. I'll tell you what. I would rather be heir to the side of caution and preach hard against sin and tell people that they need to, they need to be converted, they need to repent, they need to have a new birth, they must be born again, you know? I'd rather, if I'm in error, I'd rather err to that side than err to the side of telling people that are lost that they're saved. You talk about a horrible thing to do to somebody you tell somebody who's never truly been born again that they're saved and that they're on their way to heaven simply because they have a profession. The works aren't there, but they have a profession, so, brother, I believe you're saved. I talked to a guy the one time, he told me he knew a transvestite, a transgender sodomite, and he said, I believed it was saved. It had the right profession, you see. Didn't matter about the works as long as you have the profession. As long as you make a profession of faith. Brother, let me tell you something. Sister, let me tell you something. The worst heresy right now, I'd say the two worst, are the new versions, people that attack the King James Bible, and this easy believism thing. I'm telling you, it is tragic. These lying false prophets that are out there, they're telling people you can be saved and nothing happens. No change in your life. There's nothing. That is a damnable heresy. Something has to change. And if you have had no change in your life, if you can say, I've never had that point in time when something really happened. You might be a false convert. Maybe you're just, you've wandered out of the way of understanding and you're remaining in the congregation of the dead. Maybe that's there, but maybe you're a false convert. Get it fixed up. Get it straightened out. I had to come to a place in my own life where I prayed a prayer when I was an eight-year-old boy and I started thinking to myself, I don't know if I'm really saved. My works do not line up with the people in this book. I can't tell you for sure that I'm saved. And I got scared. You see, if I would have died, I didn't know for sure where I was going. I believed I'd be going to heaven because I prayed the prayer, but there was no change in my life. And I made sure. And if you are watching this video and you say, well, you know, brother, I, I, I think that I have a good feeling. I, I think I'm saved. <laughs> You know, it's like saying, uh, you know, I think I'm going to take this, this glass and uh, I think that might be olive oil in there. I think. Eh, oh, well, I'm just going to drink it. Oh, it was, uh, it was actually drain, and drain opener or uh, whatever. There's no label on it. 
So you just have to guess at what it is. See? Bad idea. Real bad idea. You make sure before you put something into your body. You don't just go fumbling around through the dark and grab something. Oh, it's a bottle. I think I'll take a drink. You'd be crazy to do that. And you're even crazier to fool around with your salvation. And to say, I, I trust that I'm saved because I prayed a prayer. And yeah, there's been no change. And I'm still really, really struggling with lots and lots of sins. And I really don't understand a lot of this Bible-believing stuff and whatever else. But I'm saved because I prayed a prayer. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? I mean, what if I'm wrong? I'm just a little bit too zealous against sin. Okay. You know, I'm going to get up there to the judgment seat and the Lord's going to say, you know, I really wish you wouldn't have been so rough on sin, Brian. You know, yeah, right. Like the Lord Jesus Christ would say that. I was too rough on sin. Give me a break. He say, well, you're preaching work salvation. No, I'm not. Work salvation is being justified by the Ten Commandments. Saying, I keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. I didn't say that. I said, you get saved, the Ten Commandments is your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. After that, after salvation, after you come to Jesus Christ and put your faith 100% in Him and His shed blood that He shed on the cross to pay for your sins, after your faith in Jesus, there are to be works, meat for repentance. If I was teaching that you keep the Ten Commandments to stay saved, that's work salvation. But teaching that you put faith in Jesus Christ and then works happen, that's not work salvation. That is not work salvation. And there are liars all over YouTube now that are taking my words and twisting my videos to make it look like I'm teaching work salvation. And God will judge them. I, you know, I'm not going to go after them, court and stuff like this and whatever. Hey, my videos are copyright free. Okay? If you want to lie about me, go ahead. You'll answer for it. The Lord will recompense. Okay? He'll revenge. I don't have to. But don't be drawn in by this. Don't be deceived into thinking that a prayer is all that's needed. And no works. No changed life. Don't be deceived into thinking that. You better be careful. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. I know a lot of people that are like that. You look at their works, their profession could be the nicest little profession you ever heard, but you look at their works, they are corrupt, they are abominable. They look like the world, they talk like the world, they act like the world, they think like the world, and they hate you as a Bible-believing Christian just as much as the lost world does. Why? Because they are the world. They have head knowledge, but no heartfelt conviction. And they're going to go to hell. How very sad. And you preachers out there that are preaching this faith, prayer only, and there's no works at all after salvation, you that are preaching that, if you're even saved, you're going to answer because you are ignorant of the Scriptures. And you try to ignore whole portions of the Bible that teach against your damnable doctrine. I, I'm telling you, I mean, I'm getting this thing a lot. And I, that's why I keep mentioning it in a lot of the sermons. I mean, it's getting sick and tired of it. I'm getting sick and tired of it. And I'm going to tell you something. At the rapture, there's going to be a lot of shocked people. A lot of people going, whoa, wait a second. That couldn't have been the rapture because after all, I'm still here. And it, I was a Christian. No, you were a false convert, led astray by some lying false prophet that told you that your prayer was enough to save you. And that there's no works meet for repentance. There's no Ten Commandments, many, many, many more than just Ten Commandments that you keep after you get saved that are part of the normal Christian life. You don't keep them to stay saved. You keep them because you are saved. It's very important. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for your word. Without it, we would not know these truths, Lord. And, and we could be easily deceived by many people. We could be deceived into keeping the law to stay saved. And we could be deceived into thinking that a simple prayer is all that's needed. And no changed life, no 
no new creature in Christ Jesus. Just saying words is enough to save. But Lord, we know that both of those systems are in error. We know that we must come to you as sinners according to your word and we have to be willing to live a life that's pleasing to you after that point in time. We are now sons of yours, daughters of yours, after salvation, and you expect us to live in certain ways. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those out there that are truly saved, true King James Bible believers, I pray that they would be able to see what areas of their life they need to clean up, what areas where they are disobeying your commandments. And seek to come back and restore that fellowship, Lord, so that they'll have rewards one day at the judgment seat of Christ and millennial inheritance when they come back. And uh, Lord, I just pray that uh, you would just continue uh, to show people the truth. And I pray that you would do it through me, through this ministry. If I'm wrong, Lord, then please correct me. But it, I, I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody out there that thinks I'm wrong, that they would use Scripture. And, and come to me with Scripture, not with their own appealing, opinions and feelings and things. And so I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's it. Um, keep trying to do these messages outside, but many times uh, we have to do them inside because of rain and, and whatever else. Um, I don't know if I'm ever going to go back. I'll just throw this out there for people. Uh, what would you like to see in the future when we eventually, you know, have our more permanent setup? Would you like to see the old thing, the old books, the old books backdrop, or would you like to see more outdoors types of things like that? Just curious. Uh, post your thoughts down in the comments down there. Um, I'd appreciate that. I'd like to have input from the body of Christ. I'd like to have people say, hey, brother, you know, I really like this, or hey, I really like that, or you know, eh, I didn't really like it when you did this or that, you know. Any suggestions, I'm, I'm always open to that. So that's it. Thank you for watching.